Okay then, uh, my name is David Bashford. I'm from the Advanced Composites Group. And uh, I thought I'd uh, briefly say to start with, I didn't think that uh, working with composites was necessarily that stressful. I've been working with them for over 30 years, and as you can see, I don't have many gray hairs. <laughs> okay, um, ACG is um, primarily a, a prepreg manufacturer, and we formulate our own resins and we now have a very large and comprehensive range of different classes of resin systems. Um, basically, we class them primarily by their cure temperatures. So we have uh, low temperature curing systems, medium temperature curing systems, and high temperature curing systems. Um, and when we started in business uh, back in the 1980s, one of the main themes that we were interested in was out of autoclave processing. Um, and in those days, a lot of our low temperature systems could be cured well beneath 100 degrees C. Uh, and this was used for things like tooling and for fairly simple structures. And over the years, we've developed the range to uh, cover different types of application and in different industries. So what I would like to sort of take you through today are the sorts of um, uh, applications that we're involved with and the fact that to us, out of autoclave is becoming a very, very important part of our business, um, primarily because people want to make more and more challenging structures and, and they would like to try and do them out of autoclave if they can do it. These are some of the perceived benefits of um, out of autoclave processing, and maybe this is how we see the world. Some people might disagree <coughs> with us. But essentially, if you can avoid an autoclave, you can avoid the very large capital expenditure that goes with these things. Because a large autoclave is in the millions just to get it purchased and installed. Um, the overheads of running one of these things are fairly enormous. And uh, if you look at some the earlier slide from Airbus, where they want to make a very large number of aircraft in future, if they stay with autoclaves for everything, they're going to need an awful lot of autoclaves somewhere in the world. So this is one of the main benefits. If you haven't got an autoclave, we can find you some uh, simpler ways of making the parts. So it does allow you to uh, increase uh, the flexibility of your production processes in terms of the fact you can mix and match. You can have some parts autoclave, some parts not. If you've got a new startup uh, factory or company, then quite often they can uh, uh, design those facilities around uh, oven curing uh, as opposed to autoclave curing. As structures get bigger and bigger, and I can tell you now they do get very big in some of the markets, autoclaves just aren't big enough. Just no way they're ever going to be big enough. So if you can actually make these parts out of uh, uh, an oven uh, route, uh, then that's the way to go. You also have slightly more subtle um, technical advantages, say in the um, uh, aerospace market. A very large number of the parts are honeycomb parts. If you stick honeycomb parts in an autoclave and you have to, say, apply two or three bar pressure, you have a lot of issues with core crush and things like that. So you then have to spend a lot of money stabilizing the core, and it is a lot of money. And if you're curing it in an oven and you only have uh, 15 psi one bar pressure to deal with, you can avoid these issues of uh, core, core collapse. However, if we are to go to out of autoclave processing, as, as other speakers have said, we've got to get the voidage levels as low as possible. And originally, this was why we went into autoclaves to get the voidage right down. These days, we, we're looking for, uh, for aerospace parts, less than 1% voidage. Some of the other markets, like the marine market or the uh, wind turbine market, can probably tolerate 2% voidage. But well, this is where we're aiming for with our product developments, those sorts of voidage levels. If you're in aerospace, you've got to keep your, your fiber volume fractions up. So you basically, if you're offering prepreg materials, you can't um, effectively reduce the fiber content to help you. You've got to keep it up. What we're finding these days is that uh, when it comes to prepregs, People, uh, if they're manufacturing parts, aren't just interested in having uh, a simple roll of prepreg to work with. And we're having to be more and more innovative in how we present our prepregs 
so that they're actually far more usable to the customer. So we, we have um, the, the traditional UD fabrics, but these are the ways people are going now in the fact that they want heavier reinforcements, so things like biaxials are going in. We have to format it for the uh, automated uh, tape laying and fibre placement uh, techniques. Uh, and then we've got on the end what we call combos, which is where rather than having just offering the customer just one type of material on his roll of pre break we can actually gang them together so you could have a pre break with an adhesive attached, or you could have two pre pregs attached to each other, um, or you could have a syntactic with a pre break so just basically, it, it allows you to minimise the amount of effort in doing your laminating. We have all these different cure options. Also for very large structures, they want to put down an awful lot of material in a hurry. Uh, so they don't want to work with hand laminating, they've got to be able to work with automated machines that can lay out huge uh, rolls of materials. Um, for things like wind turbines or large marine hulls. We've also had to um, adjust some of our chemistry to ensure that we meet this last criteria. If we make some of our earlier materials, which are very reactive, they have a very short uh, outlife, a working life in the factory. So we've had to adjust some of our chemistry for the larger structures to ensure that they can actually be laid up over a, over a sufficiently long period of time and still have uh, useful life left so they can actually be moulded. These are the markets that where we're finding the majority of our outer autoclave products going. Uh, primary and secondary structures and prototype structures for the aerospace uh, uh, market. And this was where a lot of, oh, wait, this one here, the prototyping of the aerospace, in, in the aerospace market was where we cut our teeth in terms of uh, out of autoclave. Um, this, is, this is the exciting area here for us in the fact that we're getting our materials uh, onto the uh, trailing edge uh, wing sets of A350. Um, and this is going to be one of the first serious out of autoclave uses in a large airliner. We can format our products to also go for other markets, such as the automotive market, where people want to make uh, body panels. Uh, and and so, certainly some of the higher volume cars, they don't want to have autoclaves, so they can actually make low volume parts out of autoclave in, in oven curings. We can offer pre-pregs that allow you to actually retain the nice, attractive appearance of a carbon fabric. And we can formulate a resin that allow you to do an oven cure so you can make a part and still have that nice appearance of the fabric to look at. This is, these ones here are where the structures are now getting very, very big for uh, some of the larger racing yachts uh, and the tooling that goes with it. And as you'll see at the end of the presentation, this down here is where the parts really get big. And we're talking about getting towards 100 metres for those now. I think we'll skip that one. These are, these are the, as I said earlier, this is where we cut our teeth in a lot of the prototyping work with Out of Autoclave. These were uh, projects that were mainly funded in the States because we have a sister company in the States. Um, and the military there wanted to make uh, one-off flight vehicles, but they wanted to do it with the cheapest of tooling. Uh, so we were offering uh, to cure these parts uh, down at uh, very low temperatures and then post cure them afterwards. So these, these are all basically one-offs, delta uh, launcher fairings. Um, so these are all materials that are cured, say at uh, 50 or 60 degrees C, but they can be post cured to give you the, uh, the higher temperature performance. So something like this material will be cured, post cured up to 180 to give you the thermal performance of a a full 180 system. These are a, lot, a lot of these are sort of UAVs. This is another market where uh, out of autoclave has importance in the future. These are all basically American demonstrators, <coughs> lots of them. And this is this is part. This is the lead up to the um, the Virgin plane that's going to take people on very expensive flights. <laughs> 
And again, these, this again is a, an, this is actually uh, one of the, the earlier ones, is the, the later one uh, following on. But these again, uh, one-off structures that can be made out of autoclave. <coughs> one of the things that we have to address is ensuring the laminate quality is how we present our materials. And what we've found is that um, for UD materials, we need um, a product that is fully impregnated. We use hot melt impregnation as opposed to solvent impregnation. So we have to ensure that any UDs that we offer are fully impregnated. However, for fabrics, we find that the reverse is true, that you often only want partial impregnation so that you have uh, the mechanism for removing the air that's trapped in the dry fabric under vacuum. And then when you apply the heat, the resin then flows in uh, and fully wets out the reinforcement. Um, we have various other tricks that we have to address. For aerospace, our systems have to be uh, zero resin bleed. So when we're molding them, we have solid release films. And this is necessary to control the resin content and the fiber volume fraction to a known level. But if we're talking about much larger structures, and there we often go for a selective amount of resin bleed because you're trying to get the air out of your uh, large structure and just relying on the air going out to the edges isn't sufficient. You want to try and get air out through the whole of the area. So in those cases we use a, a selected amount of resin bleed. impregnation. This is just a diagrammatic representation. So basically uh, fabrics, the red is the, is the fiber, the gray is the resin. This typically is how we would uh, present the pre-preg to the customer with partial impregnation. So the air under vacuum goes out that way and the when, it, when it's heated up and the resin fuses you get your complete composite. With UD, fully impregnated UD and then the trick is to get this last bit of air trapped in between the plies out which we primarily do with the rheology of the resin. And again, you end up with a... We also, in doing, addressing all these issues, actually making the composite sound, we have to address the handling issues of it. Quite a lot of customers these days are very critical in terms of the tack levels of prepregs. The aerospace market likes low tack so that it can uh, reposition things. Other markets, like the automotive market, likes the, com the other extreme. They like a high amount of tack because they're quite often making very fiddly and detailed components. So we have to be able to address that with the rheology of the, of the resin and the presentation of the prepregs. If you're trying to get air out of these parts um, prior to the consolidation, you do have to address issues in terms of how the tooling is designed, and also how you're going to get the air out of the part at the end of the day. This is where we are at the moment with our generation of uh, products for the, uh, uh, the aerospace market. Um, this one here is for uh, UAVs and is a, is, is a simpler system and a slightly lower cost system than these other two, MTM45-1 and MTM44-1 which are far more sophisticated products, primarily aimed at um, uh, primary structure. Uh, and this one here, 44-1, is the one that's going to go into uh, Airbus and A350. And this is the one that we have been qualifying with Airbus. And just to give you some idea of the timescales, we started qualifying this September 2004. The first serious production parts for A350 are going to be made this year plane's going to fly in maybe two years time but full production of the actual airline is not until 2018 so that's a long time to to get to take this product forward so that's a more recent um, version of the uh, uh, the Virgin flyer and this is made out of the uh, the next generation product MTM 45-1 Uh, that. This is a little demonstrator program that we did with uh, European funding. 
where we were looking at um, a business jet and, and, the, and the ways that we could actually make the entire wing out of uh, composite. So part of the program was to look at uh, this wing box assembly in here. Um, so they just basically took that as a small part. That's basically the construction. And as part of the program, we were looking at a wing cover to go over this box section. And this was basically, that's the final out of order clay version made out of MTM 44-1. So that's a, a, a primarily a, a UD construction with, a, with blade stiffeners on it. Uh, we also made one with top hat stiffeners. Automotive market, again, another way of presenting the materials. In this case, what we needed to offer was something that could um, be laid down very simply, make a nice rigid panel. This, this table here equates it to replacing either steel or aluminium. But basically what we needed was something that gave quite a reasonable amount of thickness with a minimum amount of plies uh, so that we could help with the laminators. So we ended up with a construction that was um, a layer of prepreg and the, uh, the dry fabric is the resin bit. So that was a layer of dry carbon fiber. Um, this is the resin in here and then there's a special little layer on there. So this is the tool surface. And then behind it was what we call a bulk ply. So this is syntactic and another layer of dry carbon fiber. And that's what I'm gonna show you this afternoon when I'm sitting at the back of the room there waving little bits about. Basically, this is very, very simple to lay up. So we're looking primarily at the cost of manufacturing parts. This can either be put cured in an oven or an autoclave, doesn't really matter. Um, up until now, it's primarily gone into the higher value cars of this world. Uh, sorts of things that people who work in composites can't necessarily actually afford to buy themselves. But there you go. Another market, this is the, um, the ocean going uh, racing series or the America's Cup series. All of these boats are now composite material. The masts and so on are still autoclaved, um, but everything else you see down here and below is all out of autoclave, primarily UD material, uh, either <coughs> foam or even honeycomb. And these, are, this, these people here often have very, very large budgets to work with if they're making parts for the um, America's Cup. And they are now going to some very exotic fibers and some very um, marginal designs is what we say. Because if they're racing these things, these things break. <laughs> Thankfully, when they break, it's only some billionaire's wallet that cops, <laughs> cops the bill. But uh, uh, these are sorts of typically the sorts of, these are all out of water clay tooling. Uh, people setting them up. So these are all pre-preg based. To allow us to tackle the marine market, we had to develop a, a new range of resins, which we call VTMs, which is variable temperature molding. And these were ones that could still be cured at the, uh, the lower temperatures, which is often <laughs> what you need to see in the, the marine market. But we've got the work life up a lot more. And again, for this market, we, oft, we often have to gang these materials together with a, a layer of film adhesive. And again, we've got syntactic films that we can offer. Another market, I don't know if you can see this too well. It's not coming out too well, but it's actually there, there, and there are three uh, uh, composite beams, which are taking all the load from the uh, concrete um, surface on top. I can probably see it better on the next picture because uh, these were installed in Spain. That's the beams off to the bridge. So basically they actually designed for these. These are basically foamed, foamed based cores. Very, very simple oven constructions, modular ovens that were just laid out <coughs> on the factory floor. These were slide in, slide, slid in, bagged, 
heated and cured. And one of the main benefits of this is that you've got an enormous span there, and these are very lightweight, and they actually installed this entire bridge in a day. And one of the, again, as, as, as we all know, composites are lightweight. So the benefit is that to install something like this, you can, you can do it with mobile cranes, they can go in quickly, bridge can go up. And, this, and there's, awful, there's an awful lot of bridges that are going to need to be refurbished in the coming years. Tooling. Um, this was where we, we started our business in low temperature tooling. We've now generated a series which is for uh, very large tools. I think we can quickly go on to that. There we go. Wind turbines. This is, this is a fairly small tool, this one here. This is a 45 meter one. Um, and as you can see, this is where they want to go. <laughs> 80 meter blades. So these are actually um, uh, uh, laid up on the uh, st st steel um, preforming uh, tools. And basically these are glass uh, tools which are made with a construction that you have a, a glass skin, then you have um, a deep section aluminium honeycomb core, which is drilled out down the length, another skin on the outside, and they actually blow hot air through the sandwich construction to heat it up. So this, this typically needs to be able to operate at 135 degrees C because you're going to be curing your blades at about 120. The blades themselves is a slightly different market because that's where the real huge tonnages of materials are going to go in and they too are going to be cured in an oven out of autoclave. Uh, and the more we invest in um, uh, wind turbines, the bigger and the bigger the pre-pregging plants are going to have to be to fuel this industry. <laughs> I think one of the main things that's coming out is if you look at some of the statistics in terms of the tonnage quantities of prepreg that are going to be used in the coming years. I know there are people from Airbus here and they might correct me, but I heard that if you look at one, just a single Airbus in one year, one of the newer ones, they're going to process something like 10,000 tonnes of prepreg just to make a year's worth of planes. So somewhere out there in the world, 10,000 tonnes of prepregs got to go through either an autoclave or lots of them or ovens. This is another market where the tonnage quantities are enormous. I think we'll leave it at that point.